Hello and welcome to another creative coding video. Recently we've done quite a few back to basics um, tutorials and we will do more um, but today I thought we'd try something a little bit more advanced and today we're going to be looking at GPU acceleration. Wow what do those words mean? <laughs> um, briefly um, GPUs are a special kind of hardware that sits inside of our computers, whether it's a laptop or tablet or smartphone or a you know, big desktop computer. And they've been developed over years to be very good at the kinds of calculations that decide how to draw sophisticated, rich scenery in um, movies, visual effects of movies, for example, um, sophisticated scenes in games, drawing characters, drawing scenery. The GPUs are also actually very good for accelerating machine learning calculations and they're being used for that purpose um, quite a lot now. There are um, programming interfaces which are um, open and cross-platform um, and also, and this is nice for us, available through the web. So OpenGL is the main standard for um, coding for GPUs uh, in terms of drawing things on the screen, in terms of rendering shapes and objects. WebGL is the cut down version which works in web browsers and that's nice for us because we've been coding in the web, for the web. Our designs when we run our code um, runs in a web browser so that means we can use WebGL to um, <clears throat> render in the web browser just as we are used to. Now there are different um, libraries for, for doing that. Um, today I thought we'd look, um, uh, go fairly hardcore and, and look, um, look at creating what's called shaders which are little programs that get put onto the GPU directly and run directly on the GPU. So we're going to go fairly, fairly low level, I guess. To motivate um, uh, our interest in GPUs, um, I'm going to show you a counter example, just to kind of show you how bad things can be before they get better. Now, last time in the last Back to Basics video, we drew, um, uh, we rendered what we called forces, we imagined sort of not scientifically correct, but forces around objects. And what we did, as we do so often, is visit every pixel in the canvas and do a calculation to decide what, um, what color to draw. Now that can be fairly intense and can take a long time. And what you didn't know was that in that video, I cut out all the waiting so you wouldn't have to wait because it's painful. But this time I'm going to actually run that code again and actually wait for the result to appear and time it. So I'll click run there and I'll start this timer here. If you did the tutorial yourself, you probably realize that the results don't appear kind of immediately. It's taking a while, isn't it? <coughs> Wow, it's um, we've been half a minute and we're still going. It's not there yet, is it? Okay, so the browser's popped up saying the page is unresponsive, but I'll I'll ask it to carry on. So we're coming up to a minute. So all this time, and it still hasn't fully calculated that uh, image that we were working on last time. And this isn't a slow laptop at all. So this is getting rather, rather painful now, isn't it? Hmm. Over a minute. And it's, it's saying, it's complaining again. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh my god, this is really taking a while. One and a half minutes gone. I feel like I want to grind my teeth now. Come on. <laughs> there. So that was... Pause that. That was about one minute forty. Um, that's a long time, isn't it? To wait for something like this to pop up. Each of those pixels had a fair amount of calculation to do for it. I mean, it wasn't actually loads, but um, coding in the web isn't the fastest kind of coding. Uh, but we kind of hope that we can do better than this. So WebGL, um, or rather GPU acceleration, is going to help us. And that's, that's what we're going to look at today. Great. So I'm going to draw some pictures just to kind of explain the main concepts. So before we had our canvas and we had lots and lots of pixels and it was 800 across and 600 down, which actually isn't a big canvas really. Most dis computer displays these days are much higher resolution, you know, HD displays and 4K displays. Now, what we did last time with our JavaScript code was visit every pixel and run some calculations and decide what color to draw and then move on to the next pixel, run some code and decide what color to draw and on to the next pixel and so on. And you can see that um, it's probably not the most efficient way of doing it. What GPUs do is they allow us, I'm just going to pick a different color to draw with, they allow us to take a bunch of these pixels and do the calculations for them in parallel. So it might say we'll take, I don't know, 32 by 32 or even more, uh, or even the whole lot, depending on how big our GPU is, um, and apply a calculation for each pixel and run them simultaneously. So if the calculation can be the same for each pixel, that's really efficient. We can parallelize the problem. Um, if we can't do that, then it, it, we don't have quite the benefit. Um, but if we can, that's, that's going to really work for us. So one analogy is to say, you know, we're drinking water through a straw and that's kind of the GPU approach. Um, sometimes GPUs can have four straws if they've got four cores or two cores. Um, with a GPU, we're drinking water through lots and lots and lots of straws. And you can see how each of those straws can have water flowing through it at the same time. So we're able to get through a lot more water because you've got lots of straws working in parallel. That's the kind of analogy for how a GPU works. It, it's highly parallel. It's not general purpose in terms of a computer like a CPU. It's, it's designed to do a few things really well. It's designed to do particular kinds of calculations, which luckily are fairly rich, and to do them in a highly parallel way. So that's the main idea. So the next um, kind of thing we have to kind of understand is the conceptual model that the hardware is, is working um, uh, with. Because when we write code, we have to match that conceptual model in order to really take advantage of it. And if we don't understand that, that's when people find coding for GPUs really hard. So the main idea is that um, the GPU has a pipeline and it takes um, data in and pops out colored pixels. That's, the, that's its job. It's to pop out pixels which are colored um, and, and in between from here to here, whatever it does, it does really fast and in parallel. Um, there are various stages to um, this, this pipeline. 
there are several stages and we don't have to fill in all of them or understand all of them because today we're only introducing ourselves to this concept. We're, we're only going to talk about one or two of those stages. And you can, of course, go and look at um, find out about the rest as well. So the main um, idea is that in our code, whether it's JavaScript or something else, we have a model of, um, oh, actually, here's a good example. Here's a cube, a 3D model of a cube. Um, and these are vertices. And we might have other things in our scene. We might have a pyramid, we might have a sphere and so on. Um, and the sphere would be made out of little, little, little triangles. Now, what we would do is we submit the picks, the vertices that describe the corners of each of these um, surfaces, and we use the GPU to transform them from this three D world into. 2D world because we're going to be looking at it on a flat display. Now we could do those calculations ourselves in JavaScript or in, in our own favorite language, but if we can get the GPU to do it, that's um, that's what it's kind of very good and fast at. So that's 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 something that can be accelerated, and that step is called a vertex shader. Now the word shader is a little bit unfortunate because it's confusing. Um, the best way to think about the word shader is a, a program, a bit of code that does that job. Um, vertex makes sense because we're taking the vertices and converting them into 2D. The next step is called a fragment shader. Frag Fragment shader, and again, you guessed shader means code or little program. Now, a better word would be pixel shader, and some people do use that phrase instead. So, once we've got the vertices mapped into the 2D world, I'll change color there. So, imagine we've got. Um, our cube mapped into two dimensional coordinates. Um, the, the fragment shader, the pixel shader, its job is to look at each of the um, pixels that are, you know, within the, um, the triangles and decide what color they should be. And you can already see that's probably the bit that we're going to be most interested in. Now, for today's tutorial, to keep things simple, we're not going to do anything complicated with many 3D shapes. So what we're going to do is simply pass a flat rectangle with four corners. Um, so it's not really 3D. Into the vertex shader. It's not going to do much. It's just going to translate the coordinates of those vertices and translate them into the right size um, for us so that they fit inside um, this special um, GPU canvas, as you might call it. So this job will be really easy. And then the more interesting job for us today is use the pixel shader to decide what color each of those pixels will be. And remember, this is the bit that's going to be highly parallelized. So depending on your GPU and your cap computer's capabilities, it might even be able to do all of them in parallel, you know, 800 by 600 of them. Um, that will depend on what, what, what computer you have, but I can guarantee you it'll be far faster than what we saw earlier. So, the fragment shader can't work because it doesn't know where the pixels are going to be that we're interested in unless it knows um, the shape that needs to be filled and that's what it gets from the vertex shader and the vertex shader is fed vertices 
um, from our code because it's got to get them from somewhere. Um, just one more thing to finish off this conceptual picture. In order to pass information through, um, we need um, to fill in some, in some information needs to be filled in. So in order for the fragment shader, the pixel shader, to successfully color pixels, its output, the output of this little program, has to be uh, the colors, the color of, of a pixel. So that's a mandatory output. Um, the input here is given to us by the vertex shader, so we don't need to worry about that. The output here has to be um, coordinates for those vertices, because if it doesn't, then there's no way that the fragment shader will know, you know, which pixels um, need to be filled in if it doesn't know the shape that needs filling. And the what we pass will be um, the the shape from from our own, you know, our own code, which we're familiar with in 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 JavaScript in the web. And and this um, could be, you know, if you're a C program, if you're a programming other kinds of platforms, um, whatever is on the left hand side here will be whatever your favorite programming environment is. But the model is more or less the same inside. So if you're doing Java or C++ or something else, um, the left hand side will be your favorite programming environment. And on the right hand side, we have to fit into this concept that, that, the, um, that the GPUs work to. Great, so that's the model. Um, you can read a lot more about this on the web, um, but uh, this simplified first steps, um, I think is enough to kind of get us going and help us to understand what we read when we look at further references. Great, so let's look at some code now. So normally we use open processing um, for coding and we still can. Um, there's a way to load um, um, these shaders, these little programs, uh, into open processing, and 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 get open pro get get processing P5JS to um, submit them to the GPU. Um, today I'm going to be using a different website called Glitch, just because it makes the job of writing um, shaders a little bit easier, because it updates the view as we code. And that's not so easy with P5JS yet. So because today's uh, session is slightly more advanced than usual, I'm going to assume that you know about web pages. So what we're doing here is defining a web page and you know we're, we're, we're loading the P5JS library as usual. Open processing does all that for us so we didn't have to bother. If you were coding for your own website, this is something you might have to do. Um, so that's fairly standard. The JavaScript that's run um, is really simple. Um, so at the moment we've got a, a kind of a template I've prepared. Uh, just very simple um, code to get us started. And you'll recognize it's very much um, the P5JS, the coding we've been doing. It's just not on open processing, it's on a different website. So you'll recognize the setup function which we've talked loads and loads about, and you'll recognize the draw function. Um, you might have come across, um, I don't know if we've covered it, the preload function, which is run even before setup. <laughs> so we always thought setup was run first, but preload um, is run even before setup. So let's kind of dissect this and have a look at it. Um, let's start with setup. Um, because P5.js is relatively new um, in working with um, GPUs. Um, some of the um, some of the kind of coding is slightly rough around the edges, and I'm sure it will improve and mature. But it's in a good good enough state for us to work with. And um, the first thing we're doing here is setting a pixel density, just because if you're using um, a high resolution display, a retina display. Um, sometimes that scaling doesn't work so well, so we're, we're setting pixel density to 1 so that we don't have to worry later about you know, things that look bigger or smaller than they should. 
You can try it without that to see what happens. Um, when we use the simple library, it set up a canvas for us already. Um, so we didn't have to, but if you weren't using the simple JS, we would have to create our own cam canvas. And it's, it's something that every um, P5 JS sketch does anyway. Um, <clears throat> and usually you might say 800 by 600 or something else. Here we've added a third parameter which says WebGL in capital letters. That tells it that we're going to be creating a special kind of canvas, a, can a special kind of canvas that the GPU is going to draw onto. So that's that's kind of preparing um, the, kind of the 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 output. So that's that's all done. You know what no stroke does draw shapes without any edges. Um, in the draw function, we are calling something called shader with something with a parameter called my shader. What's that? Well, in the preload function, which runs before setup, we're creating a shader. We're saying load shader, that's part of p5.js, with two files, shader vert and shader frag, they can be named anything, um, but you can see what they are. They're the fragment shader and the vertex shader. And these are the files that we're going to be editing. Um, and you'll see the language in a minute. So we're loading those files into what's called a shader here. And then we're, we're running it, we're enabling it. And what enabling it does is it loads those, it loads that code from those files and passes it to the GPU and along that path it gets compiled into code which is machine code um, and runs really fast um, on, on the GPU. Because it's compiled it's harder to you know, edit and debug um, and this is why Glitch makes it a little bit easier because every time we type something it'll update the output and if we make an error, we'll see straight away. That's not quite possible with just plain P5.js. And what we've done here is we've drawn a, just a rectangle, um, starting at zero, zero, um, with width and height. And you might remember that width and height are the width and height of the canvas. So fairly medium-sized canvas here. Um, now that is actually what's passed, if you remember, what we talked about here, that rectangle is what's passed to the vertex shader with the four corners. So we don't even have to um, pass those vertices ourselves, you know, just by drawing a rectangle with four corners, that will happen. So that's kind of nice. Great. So we don't think we need to do any more here. Let's look at the vertex shader, which is the first or the next stage that we in the pipeline that we're looking at. Um, it's a short program. Um, let's dissect it. So main, you can imagine, is the main function that's run. And in fact, that's the case in many programming languages. Um, and it goes all the way back to C, which I think was, was it 70s? Was it 60s or 70s? Yeah, quite an old language. Um, a very nice language actually, um, not too not too complicated and not too it didn't grow out of control. Um, so we are declaring some variables here. Actually let's work backwards. We said that the vertex shader has to output coordinates to pass on to the fragment shader. And that's the, that's the magic variable GL position that we have to fill in. It's mandatory. Um, how we do that, it's up to us. And I'm using here a something called position vec4. Now, what is that? That seems to be calculated f from this thing here, a position. So what's happened is that JavaScript when we drew that rectangle, we'll be passing those corners of the rectangle as 
a position, this variable here. And this attribute is something that tells, um, that defines the data that's being passed from our code into the vertex shader. So if you're used to typed languages, where you define the type of variable, that's what's happening here. So in JavaScript, we don't um, say that something is a float or um, an integer or a char character or other kinds. It's kind of inferred from how we code. Python's similar as well, but some languages are very strict. You have to define the type of data that a variable is going to be pointing to. So what is this? This is a vec3, and you can imagine that's that's a thing with three numbers, a vector with three three coordinates, which makes sense, um, x, y, and z. So it's not really 2D, we're treating it as 2D, even, and the third dimension will be just, um, just, just one or zero. Um, so a position is the information that's coming in. Attribute is telling it that that's, that's the translation from our code into the shader. We are copying it into a new variable because we want to change it. And we're adding a fourth um, fourth number. So this is a vec4, it's got four numbers. And that's just a requirement because that's what GL position has to be. If we didn't do that, there might be an error. So we're creating a new variable position vec4 and the name gives a clue as to what it is. Vec4 is the type. So it's a position, which is a three vector and extended by a number, which is 1.0. So now we've got a four vector. Now, because there's, uh, because P5JS's support for OpenGL is fairly new, there's some things that aren't quite as nice and smooth yet. So here's a slight workaround that we have to do. We have to translate these coordinates um, by expanding them by two and then shifting them left a little bit. If we didn't do that, let's edit that out. You can see the rectangle um, is starts at the middle of the canvas and is smaller and goes to the top right. So we don't know, we want to fill um, what we think was the full canvas. So that's just that translation step. Hopefully in the future that's all resolved, but it isn't yet. We never have to worry about that again. That's just a little calculation that's done. Um, but you can see that in this vertex shader, we can manipulate those vertices, which is what we've done here. Now, other applications will do a lot of work here of manipulating vertices. We won't. We're just interested in coloring pixels. So let's do that. Let's look at the fragment shader. Now this is really simple, isn't it? This this code doesn't do much at all. It's a simple main function, which is the main entry point into this program. And our output has to be gl underscore frag color. That's the mandatory output. Whatever is that, whatever that is, is what gets drawn as the um, pixel color. So it's a four vector which is RGBA, red, green, blue, and the translucency, the alpha value. And we've, we've looked at that before in previous videos. And instead of zero to two, five, five, these go from zero to one. So everything is a floating point number, there are no integers. Um, at the top, we've defined the default. Did we do that in the vertex shader? Oh, I should have, I think. Um, yeah, maybe I should fix that later. But the We've set the medium precision for floats. Now, high precision is obviously more accurate and we might not need it and it's kind of slower and takes more memory. So often we put that in to say that's, that's, that's fine for this code. So what's happening here? We're filling in GL frag color with a vector that's 1.0, um, a small number, small number and a one for the alpha and that's 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 kind of like red isn't it red green blue in fact if i actually make it fully red no green no blue that's a that's a deep red color if i change it to zeros then it should all be all black 
If I do green, then that should be green. So you can see how, as I edit this um, fragment shader, um, Glitch is kind of recompiling or pushing it to the GPU every so often, and I can see the output there. So this rectangle that we're looking at, um, although we could have drawn a rectangle in, in P5.js really easily, this one is being done by the GPU. Um, it, the corners are defined, and every pixel is being colored green. Um, so that's not so interesting because that's a lot of code just to draw a rectangle. Um, but as you know, we can, um, you know, if we can cut, if we can decide what color a pixel should be, we have lots of opportunities to kind of have fun with that. So let's look at um, modifying um, this a little bit. So we've messed around with choosing colors like this, um, and that's that's fine. I'm going to see if I can draw um, some shapes by deciding on the color of pixels. So what I'm going to try and do is, if I say, let me, let me try and draw something around where the mouse might be. So if I go back to my vertex shader, that's not going to be dealing with the mouse. So I need to pass the mouse position in somehow. And JavaScript knows about it. Um, do you remember mouse X, mouse Y? We need to pass that through somehow. And the way we do that is with something called a uniform a variable. Um, it's a data type which gets passed to the fragment shader. So we'll have to define that um, over here in, in our JavaScript. So let's have a look at how we might do that. Right. So the way we do it is we we have my shader which is the one we're working with and we say set uniform and then we have a name for that variable, that, that bit of data, and it's convention to un use u or u underscore for anyone reading it to know that this is a uniform variable that's been passed from our code to our fragment shader. So let's call that mouse. And what are we passing? We could say pass mouse uh, a list like this with mouse x Oops, mouse X and mouse Y. We could do that. Um, but everything in OpenGL in, in, in the GPU is scaled from zero to one. So that canvas, just like those RGB numbers, goes from zero to one. So this is an opportunity for us to use the map function that we know about to map mouse X, which goes from zero to the width and we're going to go from 0 to 1. So we're rescaling that and the same with map for mouse y which goes from 0 to the height 0 to 1. Great. Okay. So that will create a uniform variable called umouse. It will have, it will point to two bits of data, um, the mouse x and the mouse y, slightly scaled to zero to, in the zero to one range, and that will appear and be accessible to our fragment shader. But our fragment shader needs to, you know, it needs to be told to kind of expect it. So let's uh, just write some comment to say uniform variables or uniform, yep, uniform variables, if I can spell. And we're going to say uniform as the data type. Or it's a, it's a it's, yeah, it's, it's a qualifier really, um, but we can think of it as the data type. It's a vec2 because we've got two bits of data, two numbers. They'll fit into a vec2. 
and we we remember we called it you mouse so remember as we were typing this and there were errors and it wouldn't compile so the output was blank so if I mistype that deliberately there's an error oh there should be an error <laughs> that seemed to have worked anyway maybe because we're not using it okay so now with that data we, we can do something with that we can say um, we can create a floating point number D maybe it's a distance from that mouse and we can say D equals distance now remember is it dist in uh, p5.js distances in this this um, GPU code and by the way the language is called GLSL um, GL shader language so we want to create we want to calculate the distance between um, the vector u mouse and and where we are the pixel that we're looking at hmm how do we get that information so if I type in um, XY say that's that's where we are how do we how do we know what that is well the current position um, that the sh shaders at um, is a built-in variable so we can we can kind of work backwards from that and use that so we'll say vec 2 we want XY to be what that is and it's accessed through gl frag chord dot xy now there's lots of these um, special variables and you can look them up online there's lots of references out there here's just an example from the kind of official website and it tells you the kinds of things that go into the various kinds of shaders more than the ones we've just looked at uh, here's the vertex shader what output should be so GL position is what we said should be the output, but there are other outputs that are possible as well in addition to that. And there's another kind of shader called tessellation control shaders, which you're not looking at. Um, geometry shaders. There's a fragment shader, and there you go. It's it's automatically sets the GL frag chord, um, which is a four vec. And by typing frag geofragcore.xy we're just accessing the first two numbers so that's that's nice so we can pick that out um, so when you're coding for the GPU you often find yourself looking at these reference sites to find out if the if what you need is a, a special variable that's already filled in so there's lots there um, we'll get rid of that now if we did that actually it would be the wrong scale so we need to um, again this is this kind of interaction between the GPU and P5GS which isn't quite um, polished yet so we'd still need to do a teeny bit of um, um, scaling a little bit of polishing um, so we need to scale that um, by a resolution and we're gonna have to get that resolution from JavaScript so let's let's imagine that we're going to do that with a uniform resolution dot XY so we need to fill that in so that's going to be uniform vec2 u resolution that's the size of the canvas so we need to put that code in in our javascript as well we need to create that uniform set uniform we're calling it u resolution and it's going to be what's it going to be it's going to be a list has to be one thing so one thing can be a list of many things and we'll call it width and height so this is just a little bit of messing around that we unfortunately have to do um, hopefully over time as p5.js is support for um, GPU acceleration kind of improves some of these little things can be kind of taken away and we don't need to worry about them because they're not honestly not that interesting <laughs> um, Great, so just to recap, in JavaScript, 
we're creating a uniform variable, mouse position and resolution. And we're passing that as the uniform variable to the fragment shader, which knows to pick them up here. And then we can use them inside our code. So the, met the, the data, if you're interested, is being passed from the CPU to the GPU. Great, so there's an error somewhere because this is, there's, there's no output, so something's gone wrong. So maybe I've made a typo somewhere. Um, what's my typo? So I've got U resolution, have I spelt it correctly? U resolution, yep. Um, frag chord, I've spelt correctly. I'm accessing X, Y there. So this, so GLSL works with vectors nicely. Um, you know, two, three, four um, sized vectors, which is natural, you'd expect that, you know, given that it works with 3D objects. So we've got X, Y here. So why is it not calculating the distance? So it's got D. Oh yeah, it's just the missing semicolon. Now D is now the distance between the mouse and the pixel that it's doing the calculation for. We could use that just to experiment and pop in um, as a color. So instead of 1.0, we say D. I wonder what that will do. Oh yeah, look. So if we move the mouse left and right, the color changes. Now this is rather smooth, isn't it? If we did this with um, P5JS, calculated every pixel based on you know distance from the mouse, it would not be this smooth. You know, it'd be a lot more jittery. Whereas now this is super smooth. That's because it's doing it in parallel for many many of those pixels, if not all of them. Um, if you've got a you know dedicated you know powerful graphics card, it probably can do all of them. Um, in my laptop, I I don't have a dedicated graphics card, but most um, modern um, CPUs are extended with some GPU capabilities, um, so you know we still benefit as well. Now, one thing you might have noticed is there's a left and right works, but up and down seems to go in the opposite direction. Um, that's because the Y coordinates uh, are different from from between um, GLSL and, and JavaScript. So one way to fix that is I can just say, um, instead of zero to one, I go from one to zero. So that's easier to fix. There you go, that now follows the mouse. That's nice, isn't it? That's really nice. And what we can do on top of that now, now we now gets interesting, we can create a new variable. Maybe I still have to decide what type it is. We can't just say var c equals, we have to say float c equals and we can do a calculation on the distance um, and use the distance let's say that's c um, it's not making a lot of difference maybe I haven't got the scale right so maybe if I divide multiply that by say 100 I have to, whenever I say numbers like 100, I have to say 0 0.0 to signify that it really is um, a float. Because you'll you'll get errors if I say 100 like that or 10. That's an error. <laughs> that might sound strange, but in some of the older languages we, we had to do that. We had to, when something was meant to be a floating point, we had to say 0, 0.0 on the end. So 1.0 instead of 1, because 1 might have been interpreted as an integer. Um, so now that we've done that, let's see. Oh wow, look! So now I've got rings moving around with my pointer because I've got the sign of the distance which goes up and down, up and down. So this is really rather smooth. Now I'm using screen recording software here which actually slows things down a little bit. When you do it, it will be super smooth. Um, that's really really nice so you could stop there and say right we've we've learnt about 
the pipeline. We've learned about the vertex shader and the fragment shader. Um, it's a good idea to do lots of fragment shader work first if you're a beginner, because it's easy to think in terms of pixels. We've passed information from JavaScript to, um, to our GPU, which is magic. You know, that's a really cool thing to be able to do. And we've been able to accelerate the generation of this image. Um, and it's being done so fast that it can do it several times a second, many times a second, that it appears animated smoothly. As I say, I'm recording this and the recording software will just slow things down a little bit. But when you do it, it'll be really fast. So that's all the steps that we wanted to cover today. So if you're tired now, you can take a break. But if you want to carry on or if you want to take a break and come back, I'm going to reproduce now what we did last time and you know, that code that took us a minute to generate one canvas. I'm going to do that now and show you how fast it can be. So let's have a little think um, about what we're going to do there. Mm. <coughs> right, so let's, um, let's go back to our JavaScript and think a little bit about what, what information we need to pass to the shader. So we, we had, um, you know, if you need a reminder, do go back to that video because um, we won't repeat what we did there. Um, but we had a number of you know, objects, atoms or planets. Um, so let's define the number of those, let's say atoms. Um, so, so we're in JavaScript now, so we say var. <laughs> so we're coding two languages at once, aren't we? Var number of atoms is, let's say 10 or five. Um, let's create a list of them. So we're going to make a list of, I'm being a bit lazy with the naming here, calling it L, so list of atoms. Um, creating and make um, another one for, actually let's stay, with, stay there for now. So I'm making a list and in setup, I'm going to fill that list with coordinates. So I'm going to add atom locations to list. So I'm saying for var i equals zero, i is less than um, the number of atoms i plus plus so I'm going to do a loop for the number of atoms and I'm going to push onto that list a random number now because we're not using p5 the simple js we haven't got a um, random number we've only got random which is core javascript and then it's a floating point number from zero to one. Um, and we put two, because we need an X and a Y. So we could push another one, or we could just say it's twice the number of atoms. So if I've got 10 atoms, that's 20 numbers, because there's X, Y, X, Y for each one. So now I've got um, random coordinates. What am I going to do with them? I'm gonna to have to pass them to my fragment shader because it needs to know where those atoms are in order to calculate distance from them. Um, so I don't need the mouse anymore so I'll delete that and I'll say my shader um, ba -ba -bum, set uniform I'm gonna pass Uni, a, a uniform and it's going to be called atoms L for list say I'm going to pass L the list which is now 20 numbers great I'll make my job easier by also passing the number of atoms so let's call it U um, num atoms and that's the 
numb atoms. So I'm passing that information through. Great. So let's just recap what we've done there. Um, we've created um, a list of numbers which are random. There are 10 um, num atom is set to 10. So I've got 20 numbers here, random numbers. That's XY pairs. It's 20 random numbers. That's XY for 10 atoms. That's going to be passed as a list to my my shader as U atoms L. I'm also passing the number of atoms just to make it easier to unpack how many there are. Great. So let's do that. Let's uh, look at. Um, do we need to do anything in the vertex shader? No, because we're just drawing a rectangle and filling in the pixels inside that rectangle. So we don't need to do anything to the vertices of the rectangle. So that can stay simple. Now let's look at the fragment shader again. Um, we don't need the mouse. Do we need the... Uh, do we need the resolution? I th let's keep it there for now. I'm not sure if we'll need it or not. Yes, we will. Yeah, because we need to still work out x, y distances. So we've got some new things to pick up. We've got uniform. Um, and it was the number of atoms, wasn't it? So it was u underscore num atom. Now what data type was that? It's not a vector, it's just a simple number. It's an integer in fact, so it's an int. We need to say it's an int. We're also passing the list of coordinates, uniform. Um, what are they going to be? So let's write the name down. Let's think about how we're going to do this. U atoms L is the name. But it's a list, isn't it? It's an array. So in GLSL, arrays can be declared like that. So it's the size. Um, how many did we have? We had 100, 10. So we had 10. We had 10 atoms, and two numbers for each atom. So the size was 20. Actually, if we declare something bigger, that's okay. It's better not to under-declare. But 20 is the size of that list. And it's a VEC2. So that means it's 10 of those. Is that right? So 10 VEC2s. I think that's right. If I'm wrong, I'll come back and change that. <laughs> I could look it up, but that might break the flow a little bit. Great. Okay. So what? Just to recap, what with what I think is happening, we've got a uniform variable called U atoms L, the list. It can. It's a list, so the square brackets. It's got ten things in there, and they are each vectors. So there's twenty numbers in total. Right, so now in the code, I need to work out, I need to work through all the atoms and work out how far they are from the um, current um, pixel. So let's delete some of that code that we had before. So we've got the XY coordinate that we want, the current pixel, in the right kind of scale. Um, what do we need to do with it? Well, let's let's work through. Let's think out loud. We're working through each of those atoms. So num atoms. So u num atoms and. I plus equals one and then so that looks very similar to JavaScript but it isn't it's um, 
this is more like C. So instead of var, we've got int, which defines the type, but the rest is very, very similar. So we're working through the number of atoms, and then we're saying the distance between x, y, and the atoms list. Hmm. New atoms. So that's where we're accessing that list to pick out the two vector. We're calculating the distance. And we need to keep a sum of it, if you remember from last time. So we need to somehow so if we say d equals the distance, and then we, we did um, kind of a, 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 kind of a bell-shaped kind of function on it, didn't we? Go back and have a look at that. Um, I won't kind of repeat it here. So I'll type out the code and fix it uh, in a minute. I'm think It's good to think out loud and type as you go, and then fix the, uh, the syntax. So we had we had that distance, we had to raise it to the power 2, but we had minus the distance raised to the power 2, so power. Then what do we do? No, it wasn't minus distance, it was minus, so it was e to the minus x squared, wasn't it? So minus distance squared, and then we were doing exponential of that. And 2 it has to be 2.0, because everything's a floating point here. Great. So that is what we're going to add um, as for each um, atom. So go back to the other video if you need a refresher of what we were doing there. This is our attempt to model forces. So for now I'll just say S plus equals that. So I need to set float s equals zero to start with and then that gets added to and it is declare float d equals zero if i declared it inside there it wouldn't be available outside and i might want to use that for coloring so i'll keep it outside which means if it's visible um, <coughs> Actually, no, I don't need to do that, do I? That's not right. I don't think I'm going to use that distance, so I'll do that. So float s sets to zero. As I work through all the atoms, I'm adding a distance to my score, s, but I'm actually modifying that distance by this kind of exponential function. It was that bell curve, um, e to the minus x squared. Great, so now we've got a measure of this kind of strength of the force. And we can convert that into a colour. We can say float C is something depending on that colour. And remember we applied a sine wave to it to make it kind of ripple. So we'll do that sine S. We might need to scale that a little bit. Actually in the last term um, we just did a times 50, didn't we? Or a times 100 just to get it to the right scale. Yes, because we're working in 0 to 1 range, so we need to increase that a little bit to get some nice waves in. And then we can start using that for our colour. So let's see. Why is that not working? That should work, shouldn't it? Okay, so one of the annoying things with um, GLSL is there's some funny old constraints you bump into. Um, I can't use variables in, in, in the limits of a loop. Um, so there's probably ways to kind of pass that through and do it. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to say there were... How many were there? There were... Well, actually, the real answer is I should be using a const 
so that the code knows it's never going to change. So const int um, <coughs> add the spacing there to make things a bit tidier. And it's let's call it n equals five. If I say five, does that work a bit better? No, that didn't fix it either. <laughs> and bring that out to make it more efficient because it's the same bit of memory that will be written to. Um, this is one of the funny things with um, when you're writing kind of um, code that you want to be really efficient and you sometimes think well I want it to allocate memory once and then I'm going to write into that bit um, lots of times rather than create a new variable every time um, which normally doesn't matter um, but when you want to be really efficient with your code, it's the kind of thing you start thinking about. So that's just what I've done there. So I've allocated the memory for that variable once, and in my loop, I'm just reusing it without having to reallocate it. So I don't need a number of atoms here. Can get rid of that. I'll to get rid of that in here as well. I don't need to pass that along. So one way to um, debug um, when you don't have many tools to help you with error messages and things is to comment out code. Um, so I'm going to comment out all this code and because there's no C I'm just going to put in 1.0 to see if that works. Does that give me a, a rectangle? No, so that means the error is not in that code, it's still around somewhere else. Where could that error be? Hmm. If I comment that out. Just to start with a basic rectangle. So even that's not working, is it? So that means that my error must be somewhere else. Must be an error here somewhere. So I'm creating my shader. Number of atoms, list. Aha, error was num atoms. Nope, that wasn't it either. Num atom. <laughs> that was the error in my JavaScript, not even not even in my shader code. So let's go back and start uncommenting some of these things. Yep, so we're back down to <laughs> commenting out as a way of debugging. So as I uncomment, if there's an error, I'm not going to get any output. Right, let's start putting these things back in. Okay. Okay, yep, so we've made a lot of progress there. Um, so let's let's just remind ourselves what's happened. We have passed the coordinates of five atoms to our shader. The shader for each pixel, the fragment shader, has worked through those, uh, those atoms, their coordinates, and has worked out a distance and added the distance modified by a mathematical expression which we use to kind of model some imaginary force as we did in our previous video and we've colored the pixel accordingly and because we've applied a sign function it, it kind of ripples in a, in a nice way that visualizes the shape what we also did last time was we added little yellow dots to show us where those um, particles were so let's let's do that so instead of C, what can we say? Um, we can say, we can kind of overwrite that C color by saying, if it's, if our pixel is close to the atom, instead color it yellow. So let's, let's do that. So you have to think a little bit differently here. 
instead of drawing circles like we would in JavaScript, you know, circle XY, we are forced to think about what color is this pixel going to be. So this pixel will be yellow if it is within a short distance of the atoms. That's kind of how we're forced to think in this in this kind of shader kind of concept. So that's a good example there because it illustrates the different way of thinking that's necessary. So four, let's go through that. I'm going to copy and paste that because that's what we. There you go. So I'm just gonna. So that's working through the list of atoms again. Let's calculate the distance again. Actually, we can just say if distance, if distance is less than, I don't know, 0 0.01, because we've already got the distance, haven't we? No, we haven't, because that distance is only the last atom, so I need to do, I need to work through them again. I'm sure there's a more efficient way, but for now, this is fine. Let's calculate that distance again. If distance is less than 0 0.01, what are we going to do? We're going to say the color is um, actually instead of C, let's create a color variable. So let's call it color. Let's say vec3 equals cl color equals. Um, Vec3 and it's made from C. Um, zero C. And this time we're saying CL equals Vec3. And we're, we're forcing it to be yellow. And then finally, we construct the four vector from CL, and we only need to add one extra number, which is the alpha value. There you go. Phew. <laughs> That's a lot of talking and a lot of uh, typing. But actually, if you look at it, the code is still not very long. And what we've got here is that map of forces with the dots showing where those particles are. If I kind of make an edit, it runs the code again, and they're in a different position now. If I just limit myself to two particles by saying n is two, so it ignores the rest, you can see the forces that creates. Let's see three. Yeah, okay. Maybe if I um, adjust the scales a little bit, so let's say distance times 5.0. Oh, that's better. Yeah, I can see more of the contours there now. That's much nicer, isn't it? Do I want to do anything with the colours there? Still C0C. You can invent your own. You know, we've done this many times. We can use all kinds of variables as colour values. Let's let's. I'm going to try and use s the, the actual distance, the cumulative distance. Um, let's see. Divide that by ten point zero. Let's just scale it down a bit. Okay. Still, that's still interesting. Now look how quickly that was done. So if I make an edit, instead of taking a minute or fifty seconds or whatever it took, it's almost instant. That's the power of GPUs. They can parallelize all these calculations, and they're really, you know, good and fast at doing them. Um, this is almost instant compared to the many, many seconds. You know, I can't remember now. Was it a minute and a half that we waited just for one canvas to be filled? Here, it's almost instant. There you go. Let's do another one. Fantastic, isn't it? That's really nice. <laughs> 
Um, and you can play with this yourself, you know, you can um, adjust the way you colour the pixels and have many more, um, many more kind of um, atoms if you like. Yeah, that's really nice, isn't it? I think the main takeaway from this um, bit is to say those yellow circles that we drew are not circle commands. Because we're forced to think per pixel, the question we are asked is, this vertex, this fragment shader, this pixel shader, has to decide what colour the pixel is. In order to decide whether to draw a circle, we have to say, is this pixel where that yellow circle should be? And the way we decide that is to say, if that pixel is near enough to an atom, if the distance less than 0.01, then we colour it yellow. If I change that and make it bigger, those circles will get bigger. See, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a bit too big, isn't it? Let's point two. This is rather large. <laughs> point zero one seemed to be about the right size. Great. It's really nice, aren't they? Now you can again stop here and 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 be pleased that you've learnt a lot. Actually, you know th what we've covered is a lot, and um, you know people will often take days and days to get this far if they're starting from scratch. Now I'm going to do one more um, push, um, which you don't have to follow, but I think it'll be quite exciting. What we're going to do is take advantage of the fact that these things are calculated so fast, we're going to animate them. So we're going to move those atoms, and because this GPU can calculate those maps so fast, I think we can get an interesting motion, an interesting moving map of the forces. So that's what we're going to try. So let's uh, let's do that. As I say, if you want to stop now or take a pause, this is a good time to do it. Let's go back now to our um, code. So I've got positions. Now I'm going to invent some speeds. Again, I'm going to randomize it. So I'm going to have a list of speeds. There you go. And in my loop that created the positions, I'm going to add just onto the other list, the S list for speeds. I'm going to push random numbers on that as well. So for each atom, I've got X, Y for coordinates and another two numbers, X speed, Y speed um, for their velocity. So that's really easy to do now because most of the code is already there. Great. I need to also pass that on to my do I need to pass that on to my shader now this is an interesting question now we're at and I'm, I'm thinking loud because it's educational we could calculate we can move those atoms in JavaScript and calculate their new position and pass them to the shader we can do that and that's fine and that will work and that will very likely result in um, you know, a beautifully smooth animation. But if we can do work on the GPU, um, we should, because it's it's optimized for that. It's it's fast. It's parallel. Um, it's good at you know arithmetic calculations. So if we can do less in JavaScript, which is relatively slow, and do more on the GPU, that's that's a good principle. The only thing to watch out for is. Um, if you're doing much more sophisticated work, be wary of passing too much data between the CPU and GPU at every frame, because if you're passing data backwards and forwards, then that will slow your process down. So that's something to watch out for. Here we're just passing, you know, one, five numbers, so it's, it's minuscule. So I'm going to challenge myself to see if I can pass... Um, um, the speeds and let the shader calculate the positions because it's much faster at it. So I'm creating a new uniform calling U, U atoms S for speeds. So I'm passing the second list through now. Great. Do I need to do anything more with my JavaScript? Um, I think I do actually because I can foresee that in order to calculate the position of these atoms 
from the speed, I need a sense of time. Um, and I could look up if OpenGL has a time variable, but just to, because you know, this is just a simple illustrative video, I'm going to do what I know is possible, which is just to pass the frame count. So I'm going to just, my shader set uniform, I'm going to call it U frame count. Again, I'm only passing just one number, so I'm not passing a lot of data there. There you go, frame count. So passing this information to the shader, and there's not a lot there, is there overall? Great. So now I need to, did I, I'm just gonna check if I've typed that right. No, I didn't, did I? That's S, and that's S. Right, so let me prepare my code to receive that information. Uniform vec2 u atoms s. And there's five of those. And we had um, uniform, what did we call it? Frame count, did we? Yep, uniform. It's an integer, isn't it? But if we cast it to a float, uh, it means we can easily do kind of calculations with it, like divisions. Underscore frame count. So that's being passed. Let me just add some spacing just to tidy things up a little bit there. Great. Right, so now I've got these speeds, I need to update, I need to calculate the new positions. So let's do that. Calculate positions from, from initial location and time, which is a frame count. So for each atom, What am I doing? I'm going to be. I need to create a new, a new data structure, a new list of numbers, don't I? Which will be the calculated positions. So let's prepare for that. We can say vector of atoms, and there's is it five of those? Yep. Yeah. And we're going to fill that. So we're going to set each position to the calculated coordinates, which are U atoms location plus a little bit depending on the time and speed. So we can say U atoms speed, that's the speed vector. And then we can say, because if we just do this, it will just move in one direction and off the canvas. So we want to oscillate it. So we can say times sign of the frame count, which means they'll oscillate, you know, forwards and backwards or in the direction it was set in. Frame count slash 100. Remember the point zero, just to give it a scale. Um, great, so what we've done here, just to recap is, we've got the atom locations, got the atom speeds, we're calculating a new position, which is initial position plus speed times time, to get a new, new number, and we're going to use that now to, to plot the, um, to, to calculate the forces. So instead of initial location, I'm just using atoms there. Now, what have I done wrong? Oh yeah, it's not you atoms, it's just atoms. Oh wow, look, 
and I just need to update my circles there look at that magic that didn't take long at all did it um, if you're unfamiliar with some of these concepts like sine waves and so on do go back to the early introductory videos which introduce these mathematical functions because they're really useful for creative coding so you can see here if you pick an atom it's oscillating about its initial position and the forces are being calculated you know for every frame um, and that's magic see it's so fast that we can animate it now we couldn't do that before because we were calculating one frame every every minute or so and now we're doing it um, I think many you know 30 times a second or Maybe even faster, I don't know. I'm going to just uh, so reduce the um, the distance they're going by halving that. That's nice, isn't it? What else can we do? Maybe we can uh, play with the colours a little bit. I quite like playing with colours, don't I? <laughs> So one thing we could do is just play with the number, the colours a little bit. So I might say C divided by 2.0. I can't say 2. It has to be in. So you can get some different um, coloured effects there. I can speed up the um, move motion by not dividing the frame count by, by 100 by, say, 10. That's a bit too fast there. It's not as pleasing. Let's see if I say 1 minus C. So 1.0 minus C. Oh, that's nice. Oh, I like that. Maybe if I change that by, say, 2. Just experimenting here. Oh, wow. So I can get a range of colours going there. Change that by... If I didn't divide it, what would happen? The yellow patch is a bit too big. You can you can experiment yourselves. But I think that's really nice, isn't it? So we didn't actually need to do too much in this final step. I thought it'd be a lot of work. All we did was create some speeds, which are random numbers, and we calculated here the position of those atoms based on the frame count and that and the speeds. And we use the sine function to oscillate. And we then kind of calculated the forces and as I say because it's stirring it so fast we're able to animate it and you can experiment and try many more pixels you know 10 pixels 100 pixels at some point um, it'll start slowing down and, and crunching a little bit but um, it's amazing isn't it this you know from one frame every minute to possibly 10 15 30 frames every second to create these really beautiful animations so I'll stop there. Um, it's been a long video. Um, we've covered a lot actually, and you know most people will spend kind of several days or weeks um, covering the themes we have. Um, you won't if this is the first time you've looked at this kind of coding. You know, don't feel like you need to know it all, or you're a little lost. The main point of this video was one to show you the main concepts about how um, GPU acceleration works. You know the idea of a pipeline the idea of a vertex and a fragment shader and just to give you some simple examples to um, to work with now I won't do it now because the video is already long but this is JavaScript uh, loading these vertex and fragment shaders so we c uh, with with p5.js um, so we could easily do this with open processing as well I won't do that today because it doesn't add, add much value um, but just to say it's entirely possible um, fantastic um, that's great um, it'd be interesting to see what what you come up with um, in experimenting um, you know play with the power there's a lot there as I say I'm using just um, an Intel CPU which is extended a little bit um, with some GPU capabilities and you know it's not a fancy graphics card at all and yet it can still do something like this Okay, cheers. Bye.